there. Welcome to Unstoppable Truth with Camille Farrow. We are studying the book of Revelation. God spoke these words and they will come to pass. So it is very important for us to know the words in this book. Before we get into our lesson today, I want us to um, go back to the mystery of Israel. It was the second mystery that we talked about way at the beginning of class. And in that mystery, we learned that when Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, he fulfilled the first four spring feasts to perfection. Down to the minute, down to the wire, while the lambs were being slain in the temple, Jesus was being put on the cross. While 2.5 million Jews were singing the Psalms of Ascent, Jesus was hanging on the cross hearing his funeral songs sung. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was at the same time that the high priest in the temple said, it is finished. So Jesus fulfilled perfectly, down to the minute, down to the wire, the first four spring feasts. The book of Revelation is the fulfillment of the three fall feasts. If you don't understand the three fall feasts of Israel, there is no way you're going to be able to understand what is going on in the book of Revelation and why it says what it says and the timing with which it says it. Now, there's a great resource out there that is a video series by Mark Biltz, B-I-L-T-Z. <clears throat> and it's called The Feast of the Lord by Mark Biltz. And I encourage you to get that so that you can learn about the spring and the fall feast. But he has a DVD for each one of the three fall feasts and shows how it is fulfilled in the book of Revelation. And it is absolutely perfection, and it is just an awesome thing. I am so in awe of God and what he has done with this word from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, from the Alpha to the Omega, and how he has written this word in a way that is absolutely awesomely, terrifyingly, gorgeously, beautifully laced together and woven together. It truly is a marvel. I encourage every single one of you to stay reading and reading and reading. It is the most fascinating book you could ever spend your time reading. We last week looked at the millennial reign. The millennial reign is a thousand years of rest. Remember, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day to God. That was our first mystery. And God worked for six days, then rested on the seventh day. The earth has been working for 6,000 years. You and I are now living early in the morning on that seventh day from Adam or third day from Jesus. And we are now living, crossing over into, our generation is the generation that will cross over into the millennial reign or a thousand years of rest. Just like God rested on the seventh day, the earth will rest for a thousand years. We saw last week that Satan was bound for a thousand years, but he will re be released for a short time at the end of that thousand years. We saw that those who were beheaded during the great tribulation were going to be ruling and sitting on thrones, ruling and reigning. We saw, um, saw all kinds of interesting details about the millennial reign. Now let's continue right after these scriptures about the millennial reign and see what happens at the end of the millennial reign after this thousand years is up. Oh, and before I get there, I have to explain the final uh, fall feast, the seventh one, and it's called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Sukkot. And it's the third of the fall feasts, and it's the last of the feast cycle. It is a week-long party outside, basically. The Jewish people are ordered to go and live in a sukkah or a sukkot, a temporary dwelling place that they build, like a tent, um, outside underneath the stars. And while they're living and eating their meals outside, they are calling on God to come and dwell with them. They are pulling on him, they are calling on him, but that is what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about, is about God coming down and tabernacling with man. An interesting aside here is that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he was born in what they would call a stable. Truth be told, it was a Sukkot. It was a temporary dwelling that they used for the Feast of Sukkot, and once they were done with their temporary dwelling places, they would give them over to the animals. And that's the way the stables were. They were these temporary Sukkots. He literally was born during the Feast of Sukkot. 
and he was God coming down and dwelling with man. So it is truly a marvel at how God has fulfilled um, these feasts. Now, this seven-day celebration outside, the last day of this cel celebration is called um, Hoshana Rabbah, and it is the final day. In the Midrash the, of the Jews, they say that if you don't receive your atonement on Rosh Hashanah, the rapture or resurrection from the dead, then you will receive your atonement for sin at Yom Kippur. That would be the bulls of wrath. If you don't receive your atonement at the bulls of wrath, you will receive it on Hoshana Rabbah, the very last day of the Feast of Tabernacles is when you will get your judgment. So there's three judgments. There is the, judge, the first judgment, which is the first resurrection, the second judgment, which is the bulls of wrath of the alive sinners on the earth, and the final judgment, which would be on Hoshana Rabbah. We're going to see now that these are the dead sinners that have been in their graves for a thousand years. They are going to resurrect from the dead and now get judged. So let's take a look at that. Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his place of confinement. And he will go forth to deceive and seduce and lead astray the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to muster them for war. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they swarmed up over the broad plain of the earth and encircled the fortress or camp of God's people, the saints, and the beloved city, Jerusalem. But fire descended from heaven and consumed them. So Satan is released. He has to go around and he's going to deceive the earth. Now we have just been in a thousand year millennial reign. Nobody's been tempted. There's no demons, no war, no spiritual war of any kind. The lion and the lamb are living together at peace. Everybody has been at rest. Let me tell you something. Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and they were at complete rest. They were at rest with the animals. They were at rest in the garden. They were at rest with God. And during the millennial reign, there will be people who will live underneath this millennial reign. And just like Adam and Eve had fallen in the Garden of Eden, the perfection of God and the rest of God, and they fell to temptation and they fell to sin, so it will be at the end of the millennial reign. A group of people and nations as vast as the sand of the sea, that is millions, are going to be seduced and deceived and tempted again in the Gog and Magog War, the final war, the final battle. Why does this battle have to take place? Because God the Father's throne is not on the earth yet, and God cannot dwell with any human being that can fall into temptation and sin. He will only dwell with people who will serve and love and obey his commands and his truth in his word. He will not allow those who are weak and those who will fall into sin and into temptation to go into eternity with him at the end of the millennial reign. I call this the final circumcision of the earth. It's just like Hanukkah, and it's like the eighth day. They circumcised the babies um, in, in Israel on the eighth day. And I believe that this is the final circumcision of the earth. It, it's at the end of the millennial reign, at the seventh day of rest, and we're about to cross over into the eighth day, and the earth has to be circumcised one last time. He has to cut away the flesh. He has to cut away those who will sin. He has to cut away those who will be tempted. And he has to remove them. Remember, judgment is about removing everything that will hinder love. God wants to love us. He wants to love us for all of eternity. And he has to remove anyone who will hinder that love. Something that I pray is in the Ten Commandments, it says that those who are cursed, it, it, it will, are cursed are cursed to the third and fourth generation. But those who are blessed will be blessed to the thousandth generation. And I pray that way. I pray, God, I pray that you will bless my generations to the thousandth generation. And I think that gets me well across the millennial reign finish line of all of my descendants, all of my people in my life, whether they're living uh, here and now or if they're living during the millennial reign. 
I need all of my family members, and I pray for all of them, that they will not fall at this final war and temptation of Satan, this final Gog and Magog war, that they will not be smited with the fire and consume them. Um, God the Father's fire will descend from heaven, one last time, in verse 9 there, and it says, but fire will descend from heaven and will consume them. Isaiah, um, both in Isaiah chapter 11 and in Isaiah chapter 65, he is talking about the millennial reign. And I'll just leave you at that. You can research those uh, verses out for yourselves. They're very interesting. Verse 10, Revelation 20 verse 10 says, Then the devil who had led them astray, deceiving and seducing them, was hurled into the lake of fire. Finally, he's hurled into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone where the beast and false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever throughout the ages of ages. So finally Satan has joined the, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now remember, this is going to happen on Hoshana Rabbah, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we see that this is the last day of the millennial reign. Verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and the one who was seated upon it from whose presence and from the sight of those who's on the face of the earth, the sky and earth fled away and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, great and small, and they stood before this white throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life and the dead, the dead sinners in the ground were judged. They were sentenced by what they had done. And this is how they were sentenced by what they had done, by their whole way of feeling about things, by their thoughts and intents of their heart, their aims, their endeavors, in accordance with what was recorded in the books. So not only are they going to be judged in what is recorded by angels in the books about their life from beginning to end, they will be judged and seen if they, they had missed anybody. Is anybody not in the book of life that needs to be there? So they're making sure that the dead sinners that are in the ground now are resurrected at this white throne judgment, and they are judged for the thoughts and intents of their heart. Not just their bad deeds or their sins or their accursed things that they did, but for the intents of their heart. God knows it all. He knows what we think. You know, the Bible says in Psalms that as you think, so you are. You, you will become as you think. If you think you're a loser, if you think you're not a winner, you're going to become a loser. If you think that you are victorious, that you're the head and not the tail, that you are God's chosen child, that you are adopted by him into the family of love, if you believe those things, guess what? You'll become those things. As you think, so you are. Verse 13. And the seed delivered up the dead who were in it, death and Hades, the state of death or disembodied existence. They surrendered the dead in them and all that were tried and their cases were determined by what they had done according to their motives, aims, and endeavors. So this, this is um, all the dead is, are going to come back to life again. Um, whether they died in the ocean or they died um, anyway, they will all come back together and come back to life again. Um, again, here's that picture of the lake of fire. It's Revelation 15, 20. And it says, anyone not found in the book of life will be thrown and cast into the lake of fire. Verse 14, then death and Hades in the state of disembodied existence were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was hurled into that lake of fire. I'm going to repeat it again, the Midrash. If you don't receive your judgment, your atonement for sins at Rosh Hashanah, the resurrection from the dead of the saints, the rapture, if you don't get your judgment then, you will get your judgment for the atonement of sins at, at Yom Kippur, which is the bulls of the wrath of God, the alive sinners dying at that point. If you don't get your judgment then, then you will get it at Hoshana Rabbah, the end of the millennial reign or the end of the Feast of Tabernacles when God comes down and dwells with men. That Hoshana Rabbah is the, sec is the great white throne judgment. It is also referred to as the second death as we're going to see here in just a minute. Hell is real. 
It is a very real thing. I want to tell you a testimony. Um, this is an African pastor. His name is, I'm going to say his last name a little bit wrong here probably, but it's Daniel Akuchukwu, <laughs> and he is this pastor from Africa. He was a pastor of a Christian church, and he and his wife got into a fight, and she slapped him, and he was so angry with her. He left and went to church by himself, in a car by himself, and she showed up to church uh, that day and profusely apologized and wanted to make things right with him, and he didn't want to have anything to do with her, and he refused to make amends with her and forgive her. So he got angry, and he got in his car, and he was heading back home. On his way back home, he got into a car accident. And during this car accident, he died on the way to the hospital. And angels grabbed him from underneath his shoulders and picked him up and pulled him out of his body. And he went to heaven first, and it was beautiful. It was magnificent. It was the most fabulous place he'd ever seen. He was so thrilled to be there. Then an angel took him to hell. And when he was in hell he could see that there were people from his church in hell. And he said, those are people in my church. Why are they in hell? And the angel responded and said, they're in hell because they didn't forgive somebody. They didn't forgive somebody in their lifetime. And the Bible tells us that if you don't forgive another, God the Father will not forgive you. That means you're not going to be forgiven. And if you're not forgiven, you can't go to heaven. So the angel turned and looked at him and said, this is where you would have ended up if this death were eternal right now. And the pastor looked at him and said, what do you mean? I'm a pastor. I've led people to the Lord. I work for his kingdom. And I, don't, I won't land there. And he goes, you didn't repent. You didn't forgive your wife when she tried to make amends with you. You were still angry with her and unforgiven with her. And because of that, you would have landed in hell for all of eternity. But because of God's mercy and God's grace, and I'll tell you what was going on on the other side of the story. While all this was going on with him, his wife found a scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, and it says that the, the women received their dead back unto them. There were women who received their dead children or dead family members back unto them. And she began to pray that scripture. Well, her husband had been dead for three days. He had been embalmed with embalming fluid ready for burial. And the, um, the, the, anyway, she began to pray and ask for the resurrection of the dead. Three days later, he resurrected from the dead, and he came back to life again. And he came back telling this story, and it's truly a, a phenomenal story. In fact, people couldn't be around this pastor for about, for weeks, because he still stunk with embalming fluid inside of him. But he is alive, he's still alive today, and he um, wants you to know that you have to forgive people, and hell and heaven are very, very real. I think I have a picture of what heaven looks like and, and what he had seen, and there are just mansions built out of gold, and they're just phenomenal. Um, there's another man named Bill Weiss, who is a godly Christian man and has spent 23 minutes in hell, and he does about an hour-long sermon on YouTube. You can find him there. And he will quote about 50 scriptures about hell. So if you don't believe there's really a hell, listen to him, because he'll quote you scripture from all over the Bible that talks about hell. In fact, there's more references to hell than there are heaven in the Bible. So we are at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, and God the Father is now descending, and he is going to live with men for all of eternity. Let's take a look at what that is. That's Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw a new sky and heaven and a new earth, for the former sky and the former earth have passed away and vanished, and there no longer exists any sea. Remember the bowl of wrath and the seas are gone. He pours the bowl into the bowl of wrath because of the Fukushima and because of all the radiation and the, the, all the animals have to get destroyed. Did you see that and did you notice that at the end of verse 1? It says, there will no longer be the same heaven, the same earth, and there will no longer be any seas. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, all arrayed like a bride, beautified and adorned for her husband. Then I heard a mighty voice from the throne, and I perceived its distinct words saying, See, the abode of God is with men, and he will live and encamp among them, and they shall be his people, and God shall be personally with them and be their God. If you don't mind showing that slide of a great pictorial 
image of what God's throne looks like as it descends upon heaven. Um, throw that up, Adam, for me. That first picture. Thank you. Um, it, in earlier in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, we saw that God's throne is surrounded by an emerald rainbow. We also see that there's 24 elders around this throne of God, and he emanates his glory and his light. His light is going to fill the earth so full that every man is going to see on the earth just because of the light of God's glory. He says that God is going to wipe away every tear when his throne descends and hits this earth. And he's going, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be anguish, nor grief, nor pain anymore. For the old condition and the former order of things have passed away. I had asked a question um, a while ago about when we go into eternity, um, are we going to spend it floating around in heaven up on the clouds, or are we going to spend it down here on this earth? We are actually going to spend it down here on this earth. For all of eternity, Jesus' throne came down at the beginning of the, the millennial reign. God the Father's throne comes down at the end of the millennial reign. We just read that, verse 4, 3 and 4. And we now have them living on this earth. It's going to look very different. There's going to be no seas. There's, no going to be any, um, there's not going to be any um, sky the way the sky is. Uh, and, and it's all going to change. And the old, well, our old way of doing things on earth is going to be different. But they're going to be in charge of it all. And he who is seated on the throne said, See, I make all things new. And he said, Record these things, for these things are faithful and true. And he further said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the A to the Z. And, um, and I will give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. He who is victorious shall inherit all these things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son and or daughter. And so we will be victorious, and we will inherit all these things if we stay true to Christ to the very, very end. I just want to review um, that we have just talked about uh, the millennial reign, and we've talked about uh, what happens at the end of the millennial reign this week. Um, next week, we will go over uh, a little bit, a review a little bit, and then we'll press on. And we've got a few last uh, exciting hoops to jump through before we're at the end of the book of Revelation. Thank you so much for studying the unstoppable truth of the Word of God. This Word is, has been spoken through prophets and apostles and through God himself breathing it through them. He spoke it, and it will come to pass. There's no way we can stop it. We just need to know it so that we will understand what is going on in these times and we prepare ourselves and make ourselves ready. The final few classes after we finish the book of Revelation will be how do we prepare for this. So stay with us till we're done with the class. God bless you. I love you. Saints, stay strong. In the name of Jesus, amen.